The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh, thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tolhungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. The U.S. Justice Department is finalizing its first plan to address the issue of missing and murdered Native people in Montana. It mobilizes local and federal re resources and helps tribes with the investigation process. Still, advocates say there's a big hole in the plan because it doesn't apply if someone goes missing off the reservation. The Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes are the first in the nation to complete a community response plan. Chairwoman Shelley Fiant says it's about time. The tragedy of missing and murdered indigenous people is a harsh reality that native people face today. Unfortunately, no tribal nation has gone untouched by this crisis. Through the efforts of a few dedicated Salish and Kootenai tribal staff and leadership, we worked with outside agencies in a collaborative process to develop the first tribal community response plan, which addresses law enforcement, victim services, community outreach, and media and public communications. I would like to remind people that this isn't just about a document being developed or a team coming together successfully to get a job done. It's about always remembering why we make the commitment every day to do the work and who we make that commitment for. It's for those who are missing, those who have been murdered, their families who will forever hurt. This topic, as you can imagine, is heavy, dark, and difficult. But today we celebrate success and offer hope. This is a silver lining that helps, keeps, helps keep us pushing forward. This new plan also looks to increase communication among law enforcement officials, especially in places where there is overlapping jurisdiction. Blood tribal citizens are still without electricity after a 15,000 acre grass fire forced them to evacuate. The tribe says the grass fire started shortly after noon last Sunday. According to the nation's fire department, the blaze originated at a sweat lodge and spread due to high winds. In total, APTN reports 15 households were evacuated. Those families are currently in temporary shelters. Blowing snow followed the blaze, and the tribe says it could be days before power is restored. Colorado lawmakers are considering a proposal that would ban Native American mascots in public schools and colleges. The Senate Education Committee is considering imposing a $25,000 monthly fine on public schools and colleges and universities that use American Indian-themed mascots. This would take effect after June 1st of next year. Colorado is one of seven states considering legislation that would prohibit the use of Native American mascots, according to the National Conference of State Legislatures. In 2019, Maine became the first state to ban the use of such mascots. The digital news website, shethepeople.org, is celebrating women by looking to the future. The website is published by a collective of women working to transform democracy. Its 25 under 25 women of color list includes three indigenous women who are all changing the culture and political landscape. Ms. Magazine recently published that list, which includes Isabel Coronado, who is Muskogee. She's a policy entrepreneur at the think tank Next 100. Coronado is writing policy to lower generational native incarceration rates. Capulea Flores, who is native Hawaiian, is a photographer with more than 130,000 Instagram followers. She uses her platform and photos as tools for the Protect Mauna Kea movement and to help the culture of Hawaii flourish. And finally, Sierra Mondragon is the third native woman on the list. She's developing her own college major in indigenous studies. Her research has already found that in order for decolonizing efforts to be successful, 
they must actively prioritize and be led by Native women. She the people say these women are leaders to watch. They are the next generation who are forging a new way forward. Montana State University in Bozeman is receiving national recognition for its American Indigenous Business Leaders Chapter. The organization won University Chapter of the Year. In order to win this award, students had to submit a, re a recorded pre presentation about their chapters that showcased community service and culture. They also won first place in the 2021 National Business Plan Competition. The students created a sustainable business model for Turtle Island Tales to help them stay in business. Turtle Island Tales helps children and families make healthy choices. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tholahunva. We'll be right back. This is Indian Country Today. We joke around here that Indian Country Today is a 40-year-old startup. And in many ways, that's true. Our legacy began as the Lakota Times at Pine Ridge in South Dakota by Tim Gallego. A name change later, the paper was owned by the Oneida Indian Nation in New York, then the National Congress of the American Indians. And as of March 26th, we are a new corporation, Indige Public Media. Joining me to talk about the new ownership of Indian Country today is our president, Karen Michelle. We've been working toward this uh, day for quite a while. And so some of the biggest changes are that we want to expand more into broadcasting. Uh, as he said, we've had a long history, um, you know, as a newspaper and then a magazine, digital site, and then now we're expanding into broadcasting. So we've uh, been at this for nearly a year now. And so I think uh, we're gonna be focusing on trying to get more stations to pick us up. Not only that, um, you know, we have, um, I think we haven't really marketed ourselves that well. And so we're gonna be concentrating on that. Recently, we did a social media audit uh, to try to you know, find out more about our audiences. We did the same with our email uh, subscribers list. And so we are trying to find out more about each one of our segments uh, of our audience to try to give them more of what they want, more like customized content. And so, and to be in touch with them more. So I think you're gonna see more of that. Um, and of course we are looking at just, um, you know, all of our systems and how we can uh, raise the, the quality level of everything that we do. So those are, are some of the things that we're gonna be focusing on uh, that's coming up. For so long, we've been invisible, and now here we have this opportunity to reach you know, greater audiences. So I think that's, that's really great. And then not only that, you know, uh, we have a mix of veteran journalists and then younger journalists. So it really provides an opportunity for um, our younger uh, staff members to be coached by people who have been in the business for a really long time. And I think that recipe is very, uh, very good for our future. And so with technology changing the way that it is, I think we really have an opportunity to, um, you know, groom our, our younger um, people on staff and hopefully they'll take this over at some point and uh, who knows where, where they're gonna take it. Indige Public Media President, Karen Michelle. Joining us for another pandemic perspective is Dr. Mary Owen. She's Clinkett and a graduate of the University of Minnesota Medical School. She returned home to Juneau, Alaska to practice medicine, but in 2014, she was named director of the Center of American Indian and Minority Health in Duluth, Minnesota. Dr. Owen, study after study shows that Native Americans are far more likely to get a COVID vaccination. However, the data doesn't hold true when it comes to other vaccines. Isn't that interesting? Um, I don't, um, this, yeah, I, I'm going to get this name wrong, but the Urban Indian Health Institute out of Seattle did that nice study that of a thousand Native people throughout the, over the country and saw that 75% of our Native community felt, uh, was planning on getting it, and 75% of them, or three fourths of them, were going to get it because they knew that it uh, helped our community. So I think if we can convey that same message about the flu vaccine, because it does, it protects people in our community the same way that this vaccine does for COVID, then we're gonna be on spot and probably increase our rates. And a lot of us are recognizing um, the Association of American Indian Physicians just received a grant to do just that. As soon as we get done helping people, convince people about the importance of the COVID vaccine, we're also gonna be working on the flu vaccine. So you bring up a really good point, but I think our community is ready for it. We just need to get the message to them. 
Have you seen a greater interest among Native Americans entering medical school? We saw more, and I don't think it has to do with that COVID vaccine, but we saw more applicants this year than we have in a long time at our medical school. But I think that's more due to this um, on being able to um, interview online and so not all that cost to travel, which we need to bring. A lot of these ideas that came because of necessity need to be brought into the future. Maybe we'll get more natives in medicine. And again, because of that caring for our community that we know exists amongst us, I'm hoping that that's the case because we certainly need it. In the Bemidji area where I work, there's a 46% vacancy rate for physicians. Additionally, nobody knows us like us. We have this shared history of uh, genocide and, and trauma. And also more of us know about the social determinants that um, our communities are faced with, you know, high rates of poverty and uh, education issues from long historical, um, for long historical reasons, for many historical reasons. Dr. Owen warns us to remain vigilant. We're not out of the pandemic woods yet. Keep your distance, wear a mask and wash your hands. When we come back, more folks making a difference in Indian country. Ogallala Lakota College turns 50. Joining us to tell us the difference this has made for Pine Ridge in South Dakota is President Thomas Shortbull. Well, I think we have to go back to the founding of the college uh, that took place in 1971. And we owe a lot of uh, who we are today to uh, Gerald Onefeather. He, this was basically his idea. And uh, Dene College uh, was uh, created two years earlier, but the way we develop is uh, unique among all of the tribal colleges because our founders wanted to uh, establish degrees so that our people on our reservation could get employment in the professional jobs that existed on the reservation. But we went one step further than most tribal colleges in that we require all of our students to take 15 hours in Lakota studies, language, culture, treaties, history. And <clears throat> the thing that's unique about that is that we had a, <clears throat> uh, a mock visit for uh, Higher Learning Commission uh, accreditation, and we brought down SDSU to kind of have a practice session. And <clears throat> the people from SDSU uh, had a meeting with our students. And so they asked the students, they said, you know, it's going to take you at least five to five and a half years versus four years for most students to get your bachelor's degree. And that's because you're taking this, these 15 hour in Lakota study. Do you think that's, uh, <clears throat> do you think that's worth it? And they said, absolutely, it's worth it. Because we need to know who we are as Indian people. And that 15 hours does give that to us. And so uh, they think, our students think that that's critically important uh, to their development and they know who they are as Indian people. Like many tribal colleges, tuition is affordable at Ogallala, Lakota. Our tuition uh, is one of the lowest in the United States, but even more than that, <clears throat> uh, we let everybody come who wants to come to our college. The only uh, <clears throat> situation that they have to achieve in is that they have to meet our proficiency letter, uh, proficiencies in reading and math. So we require a 10th grade reading level. And uh, that may seem a little bit low, but most uh, high schools in this country, you will have people graduating from high schools with less than a 11th grade reading level. So we, we make it a minimum that you have to have a 10th grade reading uh, level and a math level to take our courses. And so <clears throat> one of our major departments of the college is our remedial program because we want to get our students to get that uh, ability in those, those two areas. So it is a really challenging situation. And the unfortunate situation is sometimes we get students with fourth to fifth grade reading levels that want to come and take college classes. 
it's virtually impossible to get them up to the 10th grade reading level. So they're really at a disadvantage, those students who come to us with very low reading levels. Ogallala Lakota College has had a lasting social and economic impact for the tribe. We employ uh, 300 people at, uh, at our college. Uh, 170 of them are with the college, and then we run the Head Start program on the reservation. So what, what, what we basically say, because we had a grandma uh, get her master's degree when she was in her 70s, so the college is from the womb to the tomb, uh, uh, to the grave. So uh, we're basically in uh, all of our uh, people on the reservation's lives as a result of our college. Recently, there's been a major revival in uh, uh, spiritual ceremonies, you know, uh, sun dances, uh, the sweats that people go to to pray. Uh, so it's, it's had a huge impact on the reservation, uh, the cultural emphasis, and I think it's basically uh, helped uh, our people a lot. And I was <clears throat> recently, you know, we were preparing for a presentation and normally our, um, the two reservations that we serve, we sure serve the Shine River Reservation and we serve the Pine Ridge Reservation. And the second poorest county in the United States is on the Shine River Reservation. But for many years we were third, but then a more recent report says that uh, we're, uh, Shannon County is either, or now Lakota County, is either ninth or 13th. So we must be making a difference uh, in the economic well-being of our reservation uh, by having a, a college. And the statistics show that uh, tribes that have tribal colleges uh, are doing much better in, uh, as far as economic or the well-being of their citizens. Congratulations, President Tom Shorpel of Ogallala Lakota College. Economic development for the Rincon Band in Southern California has taken an unexpected turn. To tell us about it, it is Native journalist Natasha Brennan. The Rincon Reservation Road Brewery, which is located in San Diego in Southern California, um, they are brewing their own beer it's grown, uh, the hops are grown on their own land with their own aquifers um, by their own farmers. They bring in all sorts of flavors and they all have different names uh, based off of their, their own tribe's history, like the Tuposh uh, Ale, which is the, um, the Luisenia word for sky. Um, they have Res Dog, um, all sorts of interesting names that uh, mean so much to the tribe. Um, their brew is all, all um, done by the tribe. They have a, uh, they brought in a head um, brewmaster who takes care of that. Um, but the Redco, which is the um, Rincon tribe's um, economic development company, they've created the brewery, um, they've rebranded. They originally started as SR76 um, a couple years ago, but Last year um, in January, they relaunched as 3R Brewery um, and then the pandemic hit. And so then they had to close, but uh, this past fall, they came back with a vengeance and they're starting to have really great sales. Um, they opened a tasting room. They're gonna reopen an, a new tasting room later this summer, um, have deals with Costco, local casinos and are bringing um, their culture to the San Diego area um, with brew. And as many know, the San Diego area is one of the capitals for um, craft brewery in the world. So they're really out there competing and doing great. Natasha, what about the stereotypes of natives and alcohol? I spoke to Ruth Ann Thorne, who's the Redco um, president at, or chairperson and to Bo Mazzetti, who's the chairperson of the tribe. And they both agreed that this is a great way for uh, for Native people to take back that stereotype and demystify it and help their tribal people be proud of something that they're putting together and be proud of something that their tribe is doing and inspire them to not only create their own brewery or get involved, but be, be excited about other enterprises that they have the opportunity to do. And um, like Ruthann Thorne said, any, any group 
um, can have an issue with alcohol. It's not just native people. So this is a great way to take back that stereotype and really challenge it and let people know that this is, that truly this, this is something that is an art form um, and is, is not necessarily the detriment um, to their tribe. They're really excited to get to know this, um, this company, get to know their, their audience. And then in the future, they're excited to launch a apprenticeship program to help their um, tribal youth learn about the art form and the science behind brewing. And so they are really hoping to take back the stereotype with education, educating um, people about their tribe and the art and science of brewing. Thanks, Natasha Brennan. Native representation in the media is challenging. Crystal Echohawk is the executive director of Illuminative. It's the first and only Native-led organization focused on changing the narrative about Native people on a mass scale. Reclaiming Native Truth set the framework. We founded the Reclaiming Native Truth Project in 2016. It's a project I founded and, and co-led. Um, you know, to really map the, what are the dominant perceptions that Americans and key institutions that impact our lives in Indian country, what do, what do they think about Native people? Why do they think that? And how, does, how do those perceptions actually impact us, you know, from the courts to Congress to every day, our representation in media. And, you know, with that, we found, you know, some really key findings that, you know, invisibility is one of the greatest, you know, challenges that we face, um, that the majority of the American public knows little to nothing about us. Um, they're not, some aren't even sure if we still exist and what little they think they know is really driven by false narratives and really toxic stereotypes that we see showing up in pop culture and media and, you know, one of the biggest culprits, K through 12 education. Um, and so really understanding that all of these things in terms of the invisibility, you know, the, the stereotypes and, and misinformation actually fuel, fuels, you know, bias um, and racism against our people. And so we found it illuminated once we published the research in 2018 to really be a vehicle to translate that research into action. Um, and it's hard to believe that it's almost been three years now since we published and to really see how, you know, not only have we been able to get out that research in the world, but just it's been exciting to see people in Indian country take the, that data and really within their own communities and their own institutions really fight to say, you know, enough is enough. Um, you know, no more stories without us and to really show people who we are um, in the 21st century. Sports franchises are finally listening to the native voice. The big news obviously in, in 2020 was, you know, the change of the Washington, you know, football team name and, um, you know, shortly followed after um, by the Cleveland baseball team, you know, but, um, you know, they became more solidified, you know, within this last um, six months year. But, you know, I think the one thing we can't forget, you know, a couple things is that, you know, as we all know, that is a decades long fight. Um, led by people like Suzanne Schoenharjo, you know, Amanda Blackhorse, and just thousands and thousands of people over time who took to the streets and fought the battles in their own school districts um, to protest outside of stadiums, uh, you know, and it really was, you know, the, the kind of the perfect storm of, unfortunately, it took the murder of George Floyd, I think, you know, with COVID, um, it just electrified this conversation, and it just happened to be that this kind of perfect storm came together obviously back in July, and we were, you know, happy to be one of a lot of people at the time that just rallied and we all worked together to organize and really create a social groundswell um, and link arms with the investor group led by First Peoples Worldwide and, and Carla Fredericks and that entire group of people have been working on it for a long time to really force the change. Um, so I think it was just such a powerful story um, about when we come together as Indian country and we organize and we push, and also when we can really call in our allies um, as well to stand with us, you know that, that big things are possible. Crystal Echohawk, Executive Director of Illuminative. A lot of things have changed in a year, but not the beauty of nature. Shot in March 2019, let's take a bird's eye view of wildflowers by San Carlos Apache College instructor, Kenneth Chan. This piece was an entry in last weekend's American Indian Higher Education Consortium Media Contest. The music is Kiss of the Sparrows by Brent, Brent Bourgeois.
Thanks, Kenneth John. For more news and updates, visit IndianCountryToday.com. From all of us in the newsroom, celebrate spring this weekend. Wear a mask and stay safe. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run Indian Country Today is produced at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. This is Indian Country Today.